found on page 1123 of your pew Bibles. It's Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 10. Starting at verse 3. For, the, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us is one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so, in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. I wanted to uh, take this final Sunday of the year, especially since it was a combined service, and uh, let it serve to uh, dedicate the uh, folks, number one, who are working among us and for us, and uh, secondly, those of you who also serve the Lord outside of, of this church, and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. Now, the reason you have the card and the pen is, uh, feel free to do this while talking, uh, I want you to write down any ways that you serve the Lord within the confines or the ministries of TFMC, whatever position you might have, official or unofficial. And I'd also like you to write down any ways that uh, you serve the Lord in other ways. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples, okay? Maybe serving God through your family, as a volunteer in the community, uh, maybe visiting folks or donations of food or clothing that you make, or being a friend to somebody, mourning with people who mourn. And uh, I just want to look out and make sure that everybody has a card and a pen. Do this? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to stand up and read them or anything, but we're going to do something with them later, okay? Uh, feel free to, to go ahead and do that. Uh, I want to start, first of all, with uh, Nick. Now, we had the privilege of the last four Sundays uh, here he did preach, and we all know that he can do that. Uh, you may or may not know that beginning on Wednesday, no, Tuesday morning, January 1st, uh, Nick officially becomes full-time here, and I thought it appropriate to uh, ask him to step forward. I just want to ask him a, a few simple questions, and uh, these aren't questions I made up. I'm not... You know, all that smart. Um, these are right out of the pastor's handbook. And they are uh, four situations such as this. Now, you know, uh, Nick was called into full-time ministry out of Bob Evans' restaurant. Where he worked, are you ready for this, kids? 13 years. Give him a hand. <laughs> college, and then seminary, and coming home on breaks and summers, and, and working there, and finally achieved uh, graduating from Northeastern Seminary this past May. Uh, worked part-time for us over the summer, and uh, according to most of you folks, decided to take him on full-time. Now, you know, James and John were called from fishing into the Lord's work. Matthew from the tax collector's office, and all kinds of other people from other positions to follow Jesus, be his disciple, do his work. And uh, that's what the Lord has done with Nick. So Nick, I just want to ask you a couple questions. As you begin your work towards ordination, and you begin full-time ministry here, you accept it with dependence upon the grace of God for its fulfillment. 
And will you nurture the gifts you've been given and the skills you've acquired and use them for the advancement of our Lord's kingdom within and beyond this congregation? Yes. And to you, the congregation, will you be open to his ministry among us? Yes. Yes. All right. The next thing I'm going to do is ask uh, members of our official board to come forward. Nick's going to kneel at the altar, and I'd like our official board members also to come up and kneel at the altar. And you need to bring this officer's pledge with you that you were given this morning you came in. Will you trust God for the wisdom and strength to accept this charge 
to fulfill its requirements, walk in obedience as you endeavor to lead others in his way. If you will, please stand up if you are working in the CD department. Sunday school teachers, help us. And just in unison say, we do. We do. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, let's uh, direct our attention back for a minute to Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 10. <clears throat> the first thing I want to point out to you in this scripture is, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, There's no gender specification here. There is no age specification here. There is no educational difference made. There is no wealth difference made. By the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. You know, true humility is an honest assessment of yourself. Some people think that I would be a humble person if I was constantly talking about all my faults, all the places that I fail and all the places that I fall short. That's true humility. That's not true humility. Neither would it be true humility, obviously, if I'm talking about all the good things I have done or could do and the talents that I have. True humility is an honest assessment. I have uh, uh, made the comparison sometimes to, you know, I do not play the guitar as good as Pat does, but I play it way better than Nick does. Okay? I don't play the drums as good as Eric does, but I play a little better than Ashley does. Okay? An honest assessment. So, when you read this, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Uh, it means an honest assessment. Okay? Now, don't overdo your position or your place. Uh, don't be arrogant. Uh, my father, who, and you will find this out as you get older, who the older I get, the wiser I realize he was. You know that. And one of the things he told me when I was young was there is no job that you are too good for. To do. Think about that. You know, sometimes folks bring the opposite attitude into the church. You know, I'll help out as long as I don't have to do that. Now, I realize some of us are gifted and talented to do certain things, but if your attitude is, I'm too good to do that, or that's beneath me, then you need to change that attitude. There's no job inside or outside the church that you are too good to do. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, function so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Um, one of the things that, that I have noticed as our church has grown over the years, and obviously we are a mega church, but we're big enough that sometimes somebody can stop coming to church here and nobody notices. And once in a while you might go, gee, I wonder where so-and-so is. Well, they must be going to a different service. And the other thing happens too, we'll get new folks to come in and sometimes they'll be here for weeks or even months sitting on, just on the other side of the aisle from you, and you haven't said hello because you think, well, have they been coming here? Are they new? 
They didn't come here a long time. Maybe they were going to a different service and now they're coming to this one. I don't want to embarrass myself by going over and saying, and, I, and I've heard stories of that happening. Welcome to our church. We're so glad you visited. I've been coming here for a year. Oh. And so we kind of hide because we're embarrassed, you know. I just want to suggest this to you. Say hi to everybody. Welcome everybody. Love everybody. Okay? Uh, you don't want to admit, I mean, I'm, I'm, let's be honest. Right now, there's probably me and maybe two or three other people who could have, you could line somebody up and, and us tell you whether or not that person has, attends here very much or not, or ever has before. You know, we played a game like that. Um, and I realize that's my job, okay? But I'm one year closer to civility now than I was a year ago, so help me out, will you? Okay? We are past the point of me being able to minister to everybody. We're past that point. We're past the point of me being able to respond immediately to everybody's difficulty. We're past the point of me even knowing about everybody's problem. But you know, you know when someone else is going through a hard time. Oftentimes before I do, and sometimes I never do. We are members of one body. We need to help each other. We have different gifts according to the grace given in us. If a man's gift is prophesied, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. Are all of you or any of you aware that the Christmas bag collection this year was in the neighborhood of $6,500? Last year, we set a record at $3,400. We just received a check in the mail this week from the week-long thing we did at Bob Evans, and it was over $100, but it came in after Christmas, so that's already a head start on next year. Some of you were very generous. Some of you went out and solicited money from other places. Some of you supported our fundraiser. Some of you gave through the offering. And some of you came up to me on Sunday or Monday with a $50 or $100 bill in your hand, shook hands with me like this, and said, here, Christmas bag. Some of you dropped money in the, in the uh, stocking out there. I got to the place after Millie went to Michigan for uh, her vacation. And we didn't have Billy the Christmas elf out there. I I could start checking his stocking, and I reached down to Bob, and oh my goodness, there's money in here. We collected money Christmas Eve in the box. I want I want you to know it. It's hard to impress me. I'm very impressed. <laughs> Sixty-five hundred dollars. Thank you for your generosity, and those of you who who worked hard to get money other places. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Now, we uh, took care of Nick. We took care of official board members. We took care of CD workers. Some of you have things written on your card, like I said, where you're serving the Lord through your family. You know, you're serving God if you're a good mom. Or a good dad. Or grandma or grandpa, aunt, uncle, brother, sister. You're serving God when you are ministering to others in the community by helping out with the uh, food pantry collection. And dropping stuff clothes in the St. Pauli shed on that. You're serving God. When you go and visit someone in their home when they're sick, you're serving God. When you're just being a friend to someone that needs a friend, you're serving God. When someone is sad, and you are sad with them. You know, I, I heard the story of the uh, little girl that came home. This was back when it was safe to let your children wander around the neighborhood. 
little girl come home and her mother could tell she'd been crying. She said, what's the matter, honey? Where were you? So I was over at my friend's house. Uh, the uh, arm broke off of her dolly. And she said, oh, were you able to fix it? She said, no. So what were you doing? She said, I was just sitting there crying with her. We're serving God when we do that. So if you wrote down anything else, whether it's serving inside this church or outside the church, I want to ask you, and you can just answer a yes in unison, do you dedicate that service to God for 2013? Yes. I want to close with this. Oftentimes, I would have somebody say to me, you know, I don't have any talent. I can't do anything. Listen to this story. Scotland, 1940s. There's a little church struggling to keep the doors open. There were two ladies, sisters, who couldn't get out of their house. Remember, this is the 1940s. No Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, they couldn't go anywhere. They refused to allow their infirmity that kept them housebound and keep them from serving God. So they said, you know what? We can't do anything. We can't even get to church anymore. What can we do? I guess all we can do is pray. And so they began to pray for their struggling little church that was due to close. As they prayed, the Lord began to work. And hundreds of people came to know Christ. And very few knew the two sisters who were housebound were the ones that God used to make it happen. How will you let God use you this year for us to reach hundreds or more for Christ? Lord, I am thankful that you have placed me in the awesome position of being the shepherd to this flock. And I ask that you would help me to be all that you want me to be, to help each and every one of these folks develop their full potential, whatever and wherever it is, serve you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We should also write prayer. And I'm telling you that because you know what? I wasn't making it up as a kid. Sometimes I forget. And I tried everything else. God gave me a good brain and I am pretty slow. Maybe I think of myself a little higher than I ought at that time. And I shouldn't. And I should pray first. If you can't, don't have any problems of your own, and you don't know anybody else with any problems, and you don't know what to pray for, please pray for me. All right? God bless. Happy New Year. Come back next week for our regular schedule.